All right, thanks. All right, here's the session. Securing to do MVC using the Web Cryptography API. All right, this is me. Um, you'll see my nice picture with clouds behind it if you ever see me. This is where I am when I'm online. Uh, when I'm actually offline or in person, I work at Thomson Reuters in Minnesota, and I hang out at uh, JavaScript MN. So if you happen to be in Minnesota, uh, swing, swing on by. Uh, to do MVC, uh, even though the lights are spying my face, who's heard of to do MVC? Who's looked at code? Who's used it? Yep, it's pretty. It's a pretty popular thing to go out and check new frameworks. Um, one of the things uh, about it that's really cool is there's other options than just MV star frameworks. There's compiled to JS libraries, and there's a lab section. Um, it's a constantly extended to add new, new and different features. Um, so what I was going to do for the session today is we're going to review some cryptography concepts. We're going to look at the Web Cryptography API, and then we're going to combine these two things to go ahead and secure the To Do MVC application. So if I was going to put that in terms of To Dos, um, secure using Web Cryptography API, and hopefully by the end of this session, that's that's checked off. Well, there's a lot of clapping over there. At some point in this presentation, I'll point out when I want you guys to clap really loud so we make them feel jealous. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize the slide when it comes up because there's another picture of me in it. So that'll be your clue. Um, I did tweet out this link. Uh, if you want to follow along, look at the source code that I have online, look at a presentation, assuming the Wi-Fi actually lets you do it. Um, it's out on GitHub, uh, my last name. Check it out. It's also there if you um, want to read it tonight. I don't know, whatever. Instead of go to the party, say beer for me, look at some source code. OK, so why do we even want to do this? Is it just to speak at JQCon? Is it just to be cool? You know, uh, well, yes, yeah, um, but but mostly because to do MVC uses local storage, and Chrome keeps local storage in a SQLite file, and you can see it's on your file system somewhere. And if you open up a command prompt, you can just go and SQLite and do a select star from item table, and I'll see secure using Web Cryptography API. So the thing that I just put on my to-do list now, if somebody can get it on my computer, they can see it. Oh, okay. Uh, the OS Pop 10 which is one of the things you mostly hear about, things like cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgery. They've got an item called sensitive data exposure. Um, and what it is, it wants you to protect data from the moment it's provided by the user, stored within the application, sent back to the browser again. So you're basically going to want to protect data. And in the list of questions on the site, on the OWASP site, are my, am I vulnerable to this? Uh, they ask, is it stored in clear text long term? And from looking at the local storage file, you see, yeah, I, I saw it stored in clear text long term. All right. So acceptance criteria. If we were kind of saying, all right, this is what I want. If I was the kind of business representative of the person saying what's secure, they would say, I want to enter a password before accessing the to-dos, and then I want my data encrypted at rest in local storage. So just kind of that's the high level requirements from that. OK, how am I going to do this? Well, as I mentioned, there's something called the Web Cryptography API, and it's a W3C specification. Um, it describes some basic cryptographic operations like hashing, signature verification and generation, encryption, decryption. Um, they list a lot of use cases um, in the spec. Um, honestly, when I read through these use cases, it's kind of confusing what they are and what they aren't. And it's actually kind of hard to place how my example fits in these. They're, they're kind of, I don't know, a little academic or something. But needless to say, there's some use cases documented out there. Uh, the other interesting thing that's out there is they, they refer to this as a subtle crypto interface. And that's kind of a hard word to say. But they name it that because a lot of these cryptographic algorithms have subtle usages. And you need to kind of know how to provide the parameters for them to kind of get all, make sure you have all the security guarantees. All right. The, this working group's been going on since about 2012. Just earlier this year, they did the last call working draft. Um, I'm not sure when it's going to hit a final recommendation. I think 2015. I um, can't, haven't seen any updated dates. Been kind of following some of the mailing lists. I'm not that involved other than just looking at it. But 2015 seems like when it's going to be. All right. So we know it's a spec. We know it's going to be sometime in the future. Well, where is it now? Right? Can I even do this? Uh, a good place to look for some current status is out on the Chromium dashboard. And actually, if you guys took the surveys um, that I saw on the table I filled out, I, this was listed as one of the tools. Um, it sees that it's in Chrome 37. It was in development in Firefox and Internet Explorer. It shipped in Opera 24 um, and some other places. 
one of my friends was saying after he saw this, Kevin, I don't even know what my current version of my browser is because it keeps updating all the time. And I said, you know, that's a good point. Um, but if you want to kind of learn your current version, go to Can I Use. In addition to looking at the state of an API, um, it'll actually there's this nice black bar across that shows you what the current version of the browser is. So that tells me that, oh, Chrome 37, yeah, that's the current one. Okay, that's, that's out there. And Opera 24, yeah, that's also current. So that actually says that some of this stuff is in the current mainline browsers today. Uh oh, cheering over there. Uh, I also has a platform status page that lists the state of, of certain APIs that are going on and what, what browsers they're in. Um, and they note here, just like the footnote on, on the previous slide, um, that I's implementation uh, was based on the spec before they switched over to a promise-based API. In fact, here's a case where I11 um, shipped with the crypto API last, I think, July, um, ahead of everyone else. And their penalty for that was they shipped before the spec change. So uh, I think they, they shipped in July based on a spec from May, and in June, the spec change to use promises. So they go at the door behind, behind the times. Um, at least they put it behind a prefix, so it's, it's okay. But that's the, uh, the challenge of implementing stuff per spec. And just like the keynote mentioned today, that's kind of the browser challenge, you know. Browsers, can, it's not finalized until the browsers implement, but nobody's testing it until it's in the browsers, and at that point, it's hard to change the spec, so it is kind of a, um, a hard cycle to deal with. Um, when I talk about promises, and there's a, I think tomorrow, um, there's a nice session on promises. Uh, I talk about asynchronous operations, things that have a then, uh, dot then in them that get a, a resolved callback. So in my code example that we'll see later, all of I will kind of back highlight in gray promise related items to just make them easier to call out so we can see them on the screen. Um, now promises, where are they? I went to Chromium dashboard. They're actually in Chrome 32. They were in, shipped in Firefox already. They shipped in Opera. Uh, so promises are actually, ES6 promises are in the browsers, um, a lot of the browsers today. And then for the, for the other ones, there is, there is polyfills. Um, lastly, if I don't have a browser that's got that support, um, what's, you know, what kind of options is a polyfill? And just this June, Microsoft Research published a JavaScript-only version of this cryptography library. Um, kind of unfortunately, though, they implemented the same uh, pre-spec version that Internet Explorer did, probably to keep consistent, cons consistency with I11. Uh, but it does actually work back to even previous versions of Internet Explorer, I think even eight. It's under active development. Um, I think it released at 101, 12 came out earlier. So that's something that's, that's uh, another way to implement this. Okay, but somebody's gonna say, Kevin, I read on the Internet that Cryptography, JavaScript cryptography is considered harmful. So why are you even talking about this? Since 2010, we've known this is a bad idea, right? And there was um, an art this article said, you know, there's no reliable way to, um, for, for the JavaScript code to verify its execution environment. And if you came to the, uh, the talk about proxying and debugging with proxying, you see how they in in injected stuff in there. That's that scenario. You can outsource random number generation, and that's critical to a crypto system, there's no value of doing crypto in the browser because you have SSL, and then, so just go ahead, store your key on the server, store your documents there, That's, that was the, the opinion in 2010, and it, there's good points there. However, um, I, my, my opinion is that didn't really consider the offline user experience, and kind of two sessions ago in this room, there was a, a whole session on offline, right? Well, if I wanna have my browser offline, I don't have a server, right? But if I wanna keep my data safe, and then do I have to encrypt it? Well, now I need to use some sort of, some sort of browser crypto. So I think, I think there is a use case there. Uh, not my idea. This is a, um, there was an Ajax pattern uh, back in 2005 called host proof hosting. Uh, it's the same concept. Host your, uh, you know, locked inside the data clouds, key at the browser, where all encryption and decryption takes place in the browser itself. Uh, Again, the requirements for that, you, st you still want HTTPS. You still need to trust whoever's serving up your web application. You know, if they're compromised, your site's compromised. You still need to defend against other security attacks like cross-site scripting. However, if your, data's, um, if your data's encrypted on the host, I think you're safe for other kind of offline attacks where they might be able to ex exfiltrate all the data on the site because it would only be, only be at risk while, while you're connected online and could be injected. So I think that there's some 
Um, still some requirements there. Uh, this is the point where we're going to clap. Um, so my requirement, right, is I want to avoid proving Schneier's law, okay, that anyone can invent a security system that he himself cannot break. So it's easy to confuse yourself enough that, like, uh, you think something's secure when it's really not. So I took this picture of myself with a grumpy cat at Michael's uh, a couple weeks ago with my daughters. Now we can really clap. So. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for that. And that'll be videoed, you know, so I'll know forever that uh, people didn't really clap, but they won't know. All right, what, what, is, what is this cryptography stuff? What are the concepts? Uh, I'm going to have a set of slides here that have a lot of words, and I know that's bad, bad presentation form, but I grabbed them out of the NIST glossary because you don't want to be making up cryptography definitions on the fly, right? We all know what happens when you make up cryptography. You end up with bugs and stuff. So I have them on there for... Um, for completeness, but I'm gonna, not going to kind of read them all. But everything is also cited down in the lower left-hand corner where it came from, because it's important to have a good, reliable source of where these definitions. Um, cryptography, we've talked about a little before. I'm not going to go over this. Pseudo-random number generator, um, a sequence of bits that are uh, determined, you know, they look random. You really To have a cryptographic random number generator, you need to make sure it's, um, it's unpredictable. And then this was one of the complaints from the, from the cryptography considered harmful article. You need randomness. Good thing is the crypto API has a uh, cryptographically random number generator. So don't use math random, not cryptographics here. But crypto get random values is uh, you pass it a integer based typed array and it fills it up with random numbers. So just like this, create a new buffer of 32 uh, bytes, pass it in, boom, random values for me. Uh, a cryptographic hash function takes a, a bit string of arbitrary length that maps it down to a fixed, uh, a fixed bit string. Um, approved hash functions are only one way. They're collision resistant. Um, you can't make a small change and get, and get uh, the same value back. You'll also see a term called message digest. In fact, you'll see digest show up in the API. Uh, that's when you apply hash function to a message, also your hash value or hash output. Um, so I'm going to write some code, but when, when your data is coming out and it all looks random and encrypted, right, it's hard to tell if it's right or not. So what I, I did to help, you know, help my, myself learn, I would go and use the OpenSSL command line tool just to go ahead and take uh, my favorite phrase, uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, and I did a, a CHA-256 digester hash of it, and it outputs this, this string that I've highlighted in yellow. Okay, now I've got some test data. Now I can test the API with. Um, so I wrote a QUnit test, because uh, this is a jQuery conference, so QUnit sounds like a, a good thing to test it with, help me understand. And I set up my test vector with the same message and the same hash value. Uh, I went ahead and then I would use, um, encode this, this data into a byte buffer. I would call the a promise, this promise-based API, digest it using SHA-256, you can see right there. And then I would go ahead and, as the result, turn it back into a hex string and compare it against my output, and, and this test would pass. Great, so that's, that's how I can do a simple hash function. Um, you may have noticed uh, in my previous slide that I had an assert.promise. That's not a real um, thing in QUnit yet. Um, I wrote this code to kind of help me do some async testing where I'd stop it and catch the promise and start it back up. Um, talking to somebody on the QUnit team, they're actually putting some real stuff in QUnit for promises, and there's probably some problems with this code not being quite the form it should be for a QUnit extension. So even though it's interesting, you probably don't want to copy, copy this code, but it, it let me get a lot of um, boilerplate code out of my test where I was constantly doing the catch and the then and starting and stopping of the test. So um, now why, why do I want to catch errors? Because I saw this the other day. So I'll go over here. Uh, I told you that Firefox, uh, or I'm sorry, Chrome 37 came out a couple weeks ago. Well, the day it did, and I ran my test, this is what I got, a whole bunch of red. I'm like, wow, wh what? Well, luckily, the, um, it tells me the, it's only supported over secure, and it gave me a bug number. Uh, so I was able to go to the, take that URL and look up. And this is where now the crypto API is only available if it's secure. So if you're just HTTP going on the internet, it won't even turn on. And that's another one of those items in the considered harmful article where you gotta make sure you can trust, you know, it's gotta be served over SSL. Okay, so this got random numbers now and we got SSL, so that's good. 
in the test, you may have also seen this, this encoder, new text encoder, and then I encoded the value. Uh, the encoding API is another um, part of the spec that's coming up. It, it showed up in Firefox 19. It looks like it's shipping in Chrome 38. There's a polyfill for it. It's just kind of now a browser common function to go ahead and take the, the, the string data and turn it into binary data. So I was able to use that um, in my tests. That's another thing I learned as I'm um, looking at one new API, all of a sudden I'm finding all sorts of other new things I have to learn. Uh, what I didn't find was a good way to convert to hex strings. Uh, so I wrote my own, and when I say wrote my own, I went and found some on the internet and then like copied it and wrote my own. I made it a jQuery plugin, even though it's really not a jQuery plugin that doesn't use jQuery, um, but it let me, uh, it didn't confuse me then with a real API like text encoder. So I, I did that here. Um, and I also did that for a web crypto API um, polyfill. Again, doesn't use jQuery at all. I made it kind of a utility um, plugin just so I could do $.webcryptoAPI. It would be easy to see in my code. Um, but I had to do something because, uh, as we mentioned, there was the crypto that's the standard, the MS crypto from i11 was prefixed, the Microsoft Research stuff was prefixed different, and then the WebKit nightly stuff was even um, even prefixed a different spot. So I needed a way to kind of wrap all those up so my, my head would, one set of code would work across all the browsers. Uh, and this is the code that, that I wrote to do that, and that's out on that, on that uh, GitHub site, like I mentioned before. So those are, those are the items you may have seen in, the, um, in that test. All right, let's get back to the, uh, uh, let's back to the concepts. A hash-based message authentication coder in HMAC. You take a hash like we saw earlier and you combine that with a cryptographic key, all right? Cryptographic key, yeah, you use that with parameters. It's almost the opposite for the previous slide. We're gonna be using a symmetric key for these where you're using the same key um, to encrypt and decrypt or to make a, an HMAC or verify the code. Uh, and the other term you'll see a lot is a digital signature. And that's the result of this transformation. So, and, and you'll see the word sign in the APIs too. So that's why we talked about this. All right, back to our friend, the OpenSSL SSL command line. So my favorite phrase again, uh, but this time I'm gonna uh, do the same digest with SHA-256, but I'm gonna HMAC it with my string key. Um, and it's gonna give me this value that I've highlighted in yellow, F7B, blah, blah, blah. All right, back to a key unit test. Let's see if we can replicate this with the Web Crypto API. Um, set up my test vector. You can see that the yellow uh, highlight is there. Uh oh, they're clapping. Now I'm feeling bad, nobody leave. Um, setting it up, set up all my data, uh, encode my stuff into the buffers. Uh, then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna have to import this key data um, into a, like a key object. So I call this, there's this import key function and I'm importing it, you can see here, for sign and verify, okay? Because keys import with different values. Then, after I get that key result, I'm gonna go ahead and sign my data buffer with the key, turn it back into a hex string, compare it, and I'm gonna get the value. All right, so now we've got through HMAC. Uh, because I'm cool, I'm just gonna pretend I have my own hash, KJH256, uh, which is really a bad hash because it's just supposed to equal my initials, so it's actually not a secure hash. I'm gonna see what that does in the browser, because you know, if I wrote all this code that works, let's, let's write some code that doesn't work. Luckily, it doesn't work in any of the browsers, but they all don't work differently. So across the different browsers, I get it, even though I'm getting an error in my, in, my, um, in my catch of my promise stuff, I'm getting not support errors, unrecognized name, illegal string, unsupported algorithm. You know, I'm getting actually a different, at least I'm getting an error, but I said I'm getting a different error string here. So here's this part where the standardization on how to, how to handle errors maybe isn't the same. So I tried the same thing using an HMAC with my, uh, fake hash algorithm, um, and in this case, I also got different errors across the boards. Now the first one um, isn't really that error coming from IE, that's the result of my kind of not quite accurate uh, key unit extension, um, but the exception that comes out of E doesn't have any, any message or anything on it, it's just kind of like they didn't know what to do with my KJH256 hash, so, um, but at least that doesn't work too. All right. We can laugh here too if we want. Okay, cipher, plain text, cipher text. Do you transform plain text to cipher text? In, inverse cipher goes the other way. Uh, AES is a pretty common government standard crypto algorithm we see a lot of. 
you can memorize that. That's a nice, so we we'll explain that. That would take 45 minutes and I'd be sleeping, right? Uh, another part that comes in is an initialization vector. Uh, and this is a, a data point that is a vector. It's a starting point for uh, an encryption process. So it helps, it helps mix things up to make cryptography work. Um, let's go back to our open SSL command line. I can also do encryption uh, with AS256 using this. Pass in the key, which I've highlighted in, in kind of a light orange color. Uh, I pass in an IV, which is the green color. And I get the output, which is kind of highlighted in yellow. All right, there's my test data. Let's see if we can get that working in the crypto API. You can see I set up my same test, uh, test vector data. Up at the top, I do all my encoding, buffers, get all the stuff in there. And then what I'm gonna do after this is I'm gonna import my key, I'm gonna encrypt it, I'm gonna turn around and decrypt it again, and I'm gonna compare the values to make sure what I encrypted is what I decrypted. So, again, import a key. This time you can see, again here, it's for encrypt and decrypt where before we saw it was for sign and verify. Once that key is encrypted in, then I'm gonna turn around and actually encrypt my data with that key. I'm gonna then take that ciphertext, take that result.buffer, turn it into hex, compare it against my, what I had saved off as my ciphertext, see if that's equal. Okay, that's equal. Then I'm gonna go ahead and decrypt it back, um, take that decrypted result, put that into the plain text buffer and compare it against my original um, plain text, and it's gonna be the same, so everything's gonna work out great. But we can see here we've got, there's a lot of code and it's indented and it's kinda hard to read and I've highlighted the promises with, uh, with gray behind it. So let's look at that example again, and, and I'm by no means a, an expert person at writing promise chains, so if um, you got suggestions on that, tweet them, let me know. Um, but another way to format that same code is setting up functions that do each of these things. So I maybe set up a function for import key, I set up a function for encrypt, I set up a function for decrypt. I set up a function for compare, and then I do what's at the bottom. Import key, then encrypt, then decrypt, then compare. And this looks probably more readable. Um, so this, you know, if you're writing code, that's maybe the style that's gonna make more sense, especially with all those nested functions and parameters going around, it's a little harder to, uh, to understand what's going on. So. I like this one. Now, I, I explain this one to my kids every time and they're sick of it, but I, they gotta go like play it on YouTube for them. Actually, I went into the DVD and played it. So I don't have Blu-ray. All right, password-based key derivation functions. So we talked before about the randomness of cryptographic keys being important. Um, however, most user-chosen passwords are low entropy. They're not that long, they don't use that many characters, so they don't really have a lot of randomness properties. So you can't really just use a password directly as a cryptographic key. Um, so key derivation functions, there are these algorithms that can derive key material from a value of passwords. You put a password in, turns around a bit, out comes a key. Um, part, of, part of what goes in there is something known as a salt. It's kind of like an IV in concept. It's a, it's a non-secret value. You mix it in and it ensures that the computations from one instance can't be reused by an attacker. Um, so in kind of the big picture, you take a key, you take a, you take a salt and a password, and you throw it into a password-based key innovation, you do have a bunch of iterations and a hash function, and out comes a master key. So it all spins around and, and works out great. Let's look at how this works in code. Um, take a password, salt, a number of iterations, a key up there setting up the text, test vector. Um, I'm just using a SHA-1 algorithm, although maybe that's not such a good idea. Um, I'm only doing 100 iterations, that's actually not, that's bad. It should probably be about 32,000 or 65,000, but 100 is fast, so it's, it's, good, for, it's good for demos. Um, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna, again, import the key, derive the bits, and then compare. So let's look at this. I'm gonna take my password, decode it, put it into a buffer. I'm gonna go ahead and import this buffer, right? This time I'm importing it as a derived key. So we've seen it import as sign verify, we've seen a key import as encrypt decrypt. Now we're importing a key as, as derived key. Um, one of the uh, interesting things is the, uh, I haven't been consistent with this parameter right here. This is actually if it's exportable again. So one of the things here is I can now import the key in but not be able to get it back out. Um, so that way if you, pull it in, the browser kind of holds up behind the scenes, you can't get it from JavaScript. So import it in, use it for drive key, then I have this key result, I go ahead and call drive bits, 
Here I want 256 bits of, uh, of keyness. Um, turn that into a, a hex array, compare it from my, from my unit test point of view, uh, see if it's equal. Great. OK, now I can, I can do derived bits. All right, so now I have all the building blocks I need. All right, so now we're on to actually what the talk is supposed to be about, okay, securing to do MVC. So it seemed like a long and winding road, kind of like Lord of the Rings, right? You know, it was like, or The Hobbit, I should say, because really, is that supposed to be three movies, you know? I uh, <laughs> thought it was one book. Um, so long and winding road, right? So again, I want to be able to set and confirm a password. I want to be able to enter and validate the password. I want to be able to generate a key from the password encrypt and store my to-dos and be able to decrypt my to-dos. So if I can do these five things, okay, I've now secured to-do MVC. All right, uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but I'm actually an architect, so I like to draw pictures with arrows and boxes, so I figured I would have to do that for this slide too. Um, we got random values for salt and IV. We're gonna wanna take our salt and our password through the password-based key derivation function. We're gonna output a key. We're gonna put that into AES along with our IV and our plain text, which is our to-dos. Gonna dump out our cipher text, and then in local storage, we're gonna store those three things. Because neither salt or IV need to be secret, and then the cipher text, of course, is encrypted. So that's what we that's what we were gonna do. That's what the big buildup is. However, this is what we're actually gonna do. Uh, because the password-based key derivation function is only in Firefox 33, if you're running the nightly, maybe, maybe I think Alpha Channel might have it. So it doesn't make a good demo uh, when it doesn't work everywhere else. Um, so for purposes of this, I just substitute an HMAC to get my 256 bits. Okay, do not try this at home. This isn't good for security, but there's my red warning flag. But it works for the purposes of like a demo. It does give me something that, that is pseudo secret. It's just maybe not that hard to crack where a uh, password based function, if you had a lot of iterations, it's harder to crack. So that's what we're gonna do. I mentioned we're gonna set and confirm a password the first time you log in. You wanna set the password, and you wanna confirm the password. Um, of course, the first thing I had to do to make that pretty screen with the red secure, right? So I put a span secure, and I made it red. Um, so then you know it's secure, right? I had an enter password field that I added. Um, and then when, when the page loads to render, I have to see you know, I can't paint the to-dos until I've decrypted them, so I gotta throw the password screen up, so I had to put a little conditional check, you know. Um, if there's to-dos, go ahead and hide the password field, otherwise hide the to-do field, um, and prompt for enter password, unless it's not been initialized, and prompt for either, prompt for set password and switch to confirm password. So a slight, slight tweak to the rendering of to-do MVC, and I use the jQuery kind of vanilla version as, as the sample for this to get um, kind of the most common denominator. Um, Subsequent tries, I wanna be able to enter my password to unlock to-dos, um, and if I type in the wrong password, I need to get some good visual feed, uh, feedback, so I wanna shake the password field, um, which comes from my favorite part of the demo. I wrote a CSS3 animation that shakes, and it looks really cool, and we'll see it in the demo soon. Even though I wrote all this crypto code, my favorite, my favorite thing was an animation. So, let's check out the demo. We're gonna go here. My secure to do's, I'm gonna type my password. A, 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 B, 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 B. See that? We'll do that again, A, A, A. Oh, that is, that is pretty cool. So my real password is gonna be test. Okay, what needs to be done? Um, let's see, uh, more clapping. Yes. More <laughs> tweets and uh, quit asking for audience help. Those things. Okay, well, we'll quit asking. We'll check that one off. All right, we'll, uh, we'll load this up again. Enter my password. What was my password? AAA? Oh, no, it wasn't. Look at this. Huh? See? Yeah. Isn't that better than tables and jQuery, right? <laughs> Test, and it unlocks. So there we go. Oh, look at that. More clapping. We can check that one off, too. Awesome. All right, so that was the favorite part of the demo. Actually, the Mac does that, you know? So I actually had to measure it, and I took my camcorder, actually my iPhone, and I'm like slowed it down. I'm like, oh, so what percentage is that? Okay, so it's pretty fun. All right, validate password. Now, 
you know, the first time through, we wanted to check to see if the password and the, um, and the confirmed password match. And when they don't, it's easy to compare the two string values and just return false. But the crypto API is a promise-based API, which means that now that actually forces my whole UI stack to be promise-based, because I can't just return, uh, enter a password and return right away, because I have to go down and decrypt, which will return something, and I have to wait for that callback. Um, so I ended up implementing um, a promise here, even though this is a pretty simple check to see if these, if these return, I end up doing a promise and rejecting it right away. Um, and if it wasn't, if it was the set, uh, enter password flow and not the set and confirm flow, then I would go ahead and return crypto storage.authenticate password, then return my util store. And all these are promises as well. Um, so this is probably a spot too where we'll look at some code and we'll say, ah, Kevin, your promises aren't quite right. You know, you did this one thing, so, you know, you can do this instead, and that's probably true. Um, I was actually uh, struggled for a while doing actually too much code in promises, and then then a sudden it occurred to me, I'm like, oh, I can just return promises from promises, and it just works, and it was like magic, and I'm on the internet, and, oh, so. But it's all, it's it's better, and it's probably not perfect, but if you can make it better, let me know for sure. Uh, like I said, the code's in GitHub, put an issue, let me know, no problem. So promise-based, authenticate, then store it, otherwise, and then after after the store return to which gets the data, then go ahead and set the to-dos to the result of the, of the turn, and then they pop on the screen because the rendering happens. Um, the store function in to-do MVC just did a local storage set item, local storage get item, which returns right away, so I had to convert that to a promise. But when you look at this, there's no, you don't see any promise. Well, it's because the underlying crypto storage uh, code that I ended up implementing returns a promise. So here was a nice spot where promises just kind of take care of themselves if you are a promise and you return a promise, it just kind of works out with the then chain. So I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, how the code, if we went back to the diagram of how things worked, um, here's the same diagram as we saw before, except for annotated with the APIs we called. Get random values, import key for sign, sign, import key for encrypt, decrypt, encrypt, and then the same stuff we stored with the parameters we did there. Uh, we talked about a random initialization vector in salt. Uh, that's how I did it, just create a 32-byte unit array and 16-byte and fill it up with random values, go ahead and save them, then save the hex values because we need to store those in local storage which holds strings. Um, now, how am I gonna generate the key from the password? And here's another one of these functions that's, that's a, nested, a nested promise. So I'm importing my key for sign and verify, right, and get my key result. Then I'm doing signing it with an HMAC, and remember that's not what we would do in real life, um, but this gives me 256 bits, so now I get that sign result. Then I take those 256 bits and I import that as a key for encrypt and decrypt, okay? I'm gonna save that up, um, then later. So this, that encryption key equals results, so I'm gonna save that encryption key for later because every time I add a new to-do, it's gonna be saving it and re-encrypting in there. Then I go ahead and see if I don't have to-dos already, I go call set item with an empty array. So the first time the user is using this system, there's no to-dos on the system, I gotta basically initialize it to an empty array. So then, 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 and then the return of that set item is another promise. So we see here that's, that I'm like four, four promises deep in this, in this call chain here. So um, probably, like I said, I'm, I don't know if I should actually had a return here or not. You know, I was like, eh, it kinda works. You know, I kinda feel like when the developers it works in my box, right, just, just ship it, right? Um, so I didn't want to end today, like this morning, I was like, eh, I'm not gonna change it, you know, because all I'm gonna do is break it. Um, but so that's, there's some, like I said, new things to learn. So even though it was a crypto API, now I had to make sure I understood promise. I had to make sure I understood that text encoder object. I had to, um, I said, more, more things to learn when you're, when you're learning one thing. All right, now how am I gonna, that, that created the key for me. Now I want to encrypt and store it. Um, I set up, uh, again, set up my data buffer here take my, my to-do list, encode it as JSON, go ahead and now what I need to save into local storage, again, is the hex version of that salt, the hex version of that initialization vector, and then the ciphertext, which is binary data. Um, so I'm gonna take my to-do list, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna call encrypt, um, I'm gonna get back a binary data, I'm gonna turn that into a hex string. Now in real life, I'd probably put it as a base 64 string so it takes up less space than hex. Um, but I only wrote the hex functions because um, it's for demo purposes. And I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna store it in local storage. So, encrypt it and store it. Um, to decrypt it, 
it's kind of the opposite. I, get, I take my read that uh, data buffer off local storage. I'm going to take the ciphertext value out of it, because remember, I'm storing the initialization vector, the salt, and the ciphertext. I'm going to go ahead and decrypt that. Then I'm going to create up a new text decoder, and I'm going to take the binary and put it back into plain text, uh, which should now be a JSON array. Then I'm going to go JSON parse on the plain text. And here's where um, it doesn't seem like you should have to do this. The native browser implementations go ahead and then throw the exception so it's caught in the, in the function error down below. Uh, but the MS Crypto JavaScript API still thinks it can decrypt it, but it's just gobbledygook, so when it tries to JSON parse it, it actually throws an exception. So that's why I had to do a catch in addition to doing a function error. But in both cases, I just call the reject method and it goes up the promise chain. Uh, so like I said, again, it's interesting when you're working with multiple browsers and a polyfill and the behavior is slightly different. So again, it's kind of, kind of got to shim over the top of all this stuff to, to make it work. So that goes ahead and then if, if I type in the wrong password, the stuff doesn't really decrypt and an error goes all the way back up and then we get the fancy shaking. All right. Now I've saved all that. I'm going to go to my local storage again. I'm going to look, and it looks all encrypted. I do, do my same select star from item table. I see the salt. I see the IV. I see the ciphertext. It's a bunch of hex data. You can't tell that what it was anymore, except unless you remember 40 minutes ago at the beginning. Then you know what it is. And that's check. Did all the five, five things to make sure secure to do's work? All checked off. And that's, that's where it goes. Questions? Or clapping? Thank you very much. I have a microphone here. If there are questions, we want to make sure to get your questions on the record. That's right. Come on, guys. It's, it's the end of the day, but you've got to have questions, right? We'll look on Twitter. We'll see if anyone's questions. See, well, you must this. have answered all their it questions. It works in my box. See, look at that. Oh, look at this. We're going to favorite things. If we don't ask questions, I'm just going to look at tweets about myself and favorite them. Okay? And go. that's not very fun. For me, it is, but. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks.